Okay, so you want to put yourself in a spaceship using Blender. Well, you came to the right place. Be warned, this will be a pretty long video jam-packed with a lot of technical information. Try to keep up, here we go. I've broken this video down into three stages. The pre-production of making the assets and planning the shots. Then the production, which is the shooting of all the blue screen plates. And then finally the post-production, which is all the editing, VFX and grading. A quick self-plug before we get stuck in. All of the project files from the video are available on my Patreon. With that you get all of the assets that I specifically modelled and textured for this video, along with all of the animated blender files with the simulations, and my nuke scripts for the compositing as well. Consider checking it out, there's some cool stuff in there and it really helps to support what I do. On with the video! First things first, before you start filming yourself to go inside of a spaceship, you need to know what it's going to look like. If you're going to be pressing buttons, you need to know where they are and what they do. You get the idea. So, my first step for this entire video was modelling and texturing the spaceship and environment. Usually, with videos like this, I naturally reach for free downloadable 3D models and assets, as it saves me a huge amount of time. But for the amount of detail this model needed to hold up in the close-ups in this video, I knew I had to make something a bit more intricate. So I spent a couple of evenings hashing out the design, modelling the basic shapes first, and then slowly going in and adding additional layers of detail like wires, small mechanical parts, etc. I'm pretty bad at modelling, it's not something I do often so I don't get much practice and therefore I rarely get any better at it. In this case, I borrowed a lot of inspiration from Ian Hubert's style of just making overwhelmingly crowded random gizmos all over the place. This sort of just comes across as visual noise, there's so much going on and it's so complicated that you're not really sure what you're looking at or if it's even realistic. But it looks pretty high tech and convincing. Once the model was done, I used image textures to add extra details on top of the geometry detail that I'd already modelled. I found a few really good textures of sheet metal from cranes and containers that had lots of rivets in that got used for lots of parts of the ship. By shifting the UVs around, I could make use of lots of different parts of the images, like lines of bolts in the metal panels. This really helped to add lots of very fine details that would be very time consuming to model. As well as 3D modelling, I decided to utilise photo scanning to make some of the elements for the spaceship. This video is sponsored by the lovely people at Kiri Engine. Kiri Engine is a photo scanning app for your phone that works on Android and iOS. All you have to do to start photo scanning is open the app and then just start snapping photos. Make sure you have enough coverage of the object you're scanning and then you can't really go wrong. Once you've taken all the photos, you just give the model a name. It gives you some options for labelling it. And then at the bottom, you have a choice of a couple of file formats and then also low, medium or high quality for the scan. Then all you have to do is press upload and it will upload your photos to be processed. The photos are processed remotely which I found takes about half an hour. Once they finish processing online you can download them back to your phone and view them in real time to see what the scan looks like. Considering the lighting conditions I took this in weren't even that ideal, I was really impressed. You get 3 export coupons a week and if you need to do more than that they have pay as you go or subscription model options. Like all photo scans you have to do some cleanup. you always end up with more than just the object you wanted to scan in the photo scan. So I quickly deleted all the vertices for the excess floor that was in the scan so I just had the guitar amp isolated. This is what it looks like with the textures applied, as you can see even at this distance it really holds up well. And then I went about placing the photo scans in the cockpit. As you can see if I jump into render mode they hold up really well and it fits in amazingly. If you're interested check out the respective app stores for your phone's operating system, download Kiri Engine and give it a try. With the finished model of the ship and the platform, I was ready to start planning out my shots. Like most of my videos, by the time I get round to roughing out the cameras, I already have an idea of how I want the shots to be. I almost edit the video in my head before I've done any filming or animating. I use this approach in place of storyboards, and that's mostly just because I'm terrible at drawing. With the master scene saved of the ship and the environment, I go in and create a camera for each angle that I want to cover in the film. In this case I had about 8 or 9 different camera angles that I lined up. Then once all of the cameras were in place, I did a viewport render of one frame through each of them and brought that into Nuke to make a shot list for the filming of the blue screen elements. I laid them all out nicely and then made a note of the CG camera's focal length for each so that I could match this on the lens of my real camera. I then exported this from Nuke and sent it to my phone so that I could use it as a reference while I was filming. Now we're moving into the production stage. For this, the key points to hit were lighting direction and camera angles. I purposefully lit the CG scene prior to doing any of the live action filming. This way I could light the ship in CG in a way that I thought made it look cool and complemented the model. And from there I can then replicate the lights for real in my living room when I'm filming myself. The only lights I recreated in my living room were the spotlight and the big area light as they were the main ones in the scene. Then I also used a big softbox to light the blue screen. It's always best to light the screen separately to your subject if you can, and have them far enough away that they don't cast shadows on the screen. Here's a pro tip for lighting green or blue screens. 
If your camera has this feature, turning on the false color view on your camera or monitor will let you visualize the different light levels much better. The different bands demonstrate which parts of the frame are exposed and at what level. The idea here is to get the green screen to be all one color so it's evenly exposed. If you see lots of bands like this, it means you've got a hotspot and should try to eliminate it if you can. Spending 10 minutes to get this right while shooting will save you hours of work fixing bad keys in Roto in post. I chose to use a blue screen over a green screen because blue screens are much better for nighttime scenes. They cast less bounce light as it's a darker colour, and also blue is much closer to the environment ambient lighting colour as it's nighttime, so you have less work to do with despilling the footage and compositing. You can still use a green screen if you don't have both. I bought a relatively cheap reversible green and blue screen for about £40 on Amazon just for this video, so I can show you that you don't need any crazy equipment to make this work. With the screen set up in the background, I set up my two lights to mimic the spotlight and the area light in Blender and at the correct angles. I'm referring to the shot list on my phone throughout to make sure that I'm using the correct lenses and the camera is at the right height. Now we're on to the final stage, the post work. This was by far the longest as you can imagine, but this is where it really starts to come together. The first step was bringing the blue screen shots into Nuke and keying them out. I didn't do anything particularly fancy for these, I just did a couple of keys for the hair and then the rest of my body, and then combined the two, and then used a garbage mat to cut out the rest of the shot. Once the key was looking good, I exported each shot as a PNG sequence of just me with an alpha to cut myself out. Then using the images as planes add-on in Blender, I imported the PNG sequences onto a plane and set it to pre-multiplied. This means when you go into rendered view, everything outside the alpha of my body will be transparent, so I basically have a cutout of me that I can place in the shot. The reason this is so important is you can now see the footage of me reflecting in all of the shiny parts of the spaceship, in the glass, in the puddles, and it also casts moving shadows and other things in the shot. So for example in shot 2 where I'm stood behind the engine, there's a light over my shoulder that the footage of me is now occluding and casting a moving shadow onto the engine. Stuff like this really helps to bridge the gap between the 2D footage and the 3D renders when they can interact with each other. The other benefit is you can do things with a moving camera. One of the main things that makes a lot of beginner's work look a bit boring is it's always shot on a static tripod. It's a bit of a cop-out as it makes the VFX in the shot much easier, and therefore a little bit boring. By placing the blue screen footage on some geometry in 3D space, you can render with an animated camera and have yourself tracked into the shot. This is a great technique for making more interesting shots if you live alone and don't have anyone else to hold the camera. For shots where I'm moving around more in the frame, reaching forward etc, you need to have actual depth in the character's movement in 3D space. You can't really do this with the footage on a plane as it's still 2D. So to recreate this, I used a photo scan of me wearing exactly the same clothes, brought this in and animated it on top of the footage of me to do exactly the same movements. I then put it in its own collection and set the collection to indirect only. This means it won't show up in the render, but it will cast shadows and also reflect in any of the shiny surfaces like metal and glass. This means when I do things like reaching forward to press the buttons, a 3D hand will actually be seen and rendered in the reflections, and you'll have the changing in the proximity of the shadows and lighting as the hand moves closer and further away from the dashboard. Then with footage or a 3D double of me placed in all the shots, I animated some buttons to turn on and bits of the ship to move as the takeoff sequence is building up to make it a bit more dynamic. A cool trick that I ended up using to make the background feel less static was making all the cables move in the wind. This is a really simple effect just using a basic cloth simulation. All you have to do is select the end of the cables that you don't want to move and assign them to a vertex group. Then add a cloth simulation onto the cables and add that vertex group to the pinning settings. Then you can add some wind into your scene and simulate them moving. It's quite a subtle effect just in the background and most people probably didn't even notice it. But subconsciously along with the moving fog, it helps to convey the sense of the wind in the scene. And then I rendered out all of the shots to be composited in Nuke. And remember that I'm not in any of the renders yet, all you see is the shadows and reflections, but adding the blue screen footage will be done in comp. There's a lot of layering going on in all of these shots. I made multiple atmosphere passes that I comped at different depths, as well as the background floating platforms in the sky. Let's start from the back and work our way forward. So it all starts with the sky. A few people asked in the Discord server when I posted a screenshot of this before I released it if I was making the clouds in Blender. The answer is no. The skies in this were all matte paintings I made from stitching lots of pictures of clouds together. This has a few advantages. One, it's easier. Two, you don't have to render volumetric clouds, which are notoriously intensive both to sim and render. And three, they're already photo real because they're actual photos of clouds. So I went to textures.com and found a load of cloud photos, as well as some smoke plumes that I thought I'd be able to repurpose to work as clouds as well. I did a bit of keying in the colour correct node to pull out some of the highlights to make it feel a bit more stormy. This then gets projected on a big sphere in the background. I brought in the animated blender cameras into Nuke so that the sky would track with the 3D renders without me having to do any manual tracking. Then I put the background platforms on top of the sky and did some grading to bed them in. I then took the smoke plumes that I thought would work well for isolated mid-ground clouds between the background platforms and the hero one in the foreground. 
I took a bit that I liked, roughened the edges of the alpha and feathered it quite a lot and then put it over the top of the platforms with about 60% opacity so they still came through a bit. A cool advanced trick is to blur the background lights and then screen or plus them on top of the smoke. This makes it feel like the lights from the platform behind are bleeding through the thinner bits of the cloud. I then added a couple of lightning flashes by taking some photos of lightning I found online in the clouds and screening this over the existing background clouds. This gives that cool look like the flashes are happening deep in the clouds but you don't see the actual bolts, just the flash. I animated it on just for a few frames, and then to mimic it on the CG in the foreground I separated out the glossy pass and linked the keyframes of the grade node to the mix amount of the lightning. That sounds pretty complicated but all it means is that as the lightning is animated on and off it will also make the glossy pass of the render brighter just for a few frames by the same amount. It saves me animating it twice as it's all linked together. Then finally to add some movement to the atmosphere I created an animated noise texture that I slowly moved across the screen. It barely moves but it's just enough that you can read some changing in the shapes and the placement of it. I use this as a midground fog that's blowing in the wind. It really helps to make the background feel less like it's a still image if it has some movement. Then we're on to the foreground magic. I then used a plane in Nuke in the same place as the one in Blender to place the footage of me in 3D space. Like I said earlier, the cool thing about this is I can do camera moves in 3D space and I'll stick into the scene even though the blue screen was just shot on a tripod. I added the normal comp bells and whistles like lens distortion, chromatic aberration, glows on the emission pass to bloom the lights, etc. Recreating the effects of light and the artifacts it creates when it enters a real lens all helps to stop making the scene feel so much like a render. Little touches like the water droplets splattering on the lens as the spaceship blows up a load of dust and water at the end is something you would never get just from a 3D render because it isn't real. So it makes it feel like the camera is physically there in the scene and it bridges the gap between the CG and reality. For the most part all the shots were done in a very similar way to this. But my favourite shot is shot 7 which is the engine starting up. This was a really cool effect, I'm not going to take credit for it, I watched a tutorial on this by a YouTube channel called Sir Floof. I'd recommend watching that video, it's only three and a half minutes long, and it shows the whole thing in a bit more depth. Essentially, it's just a volumetric shader on a cube. It's done with a gradient texture set to spherical, and then you plug this into a principled BSDF shader to get this look. Using a texture coordinates and mapping node, you can stretch the sphere out to be longer, which gives you this elongated effect. Then you can use a color ramp to add some breakup into the volume. This gives that cool look like there's multiple rings inside of the engine. Then to make it animate, you just run a moving noise texture through it to give the impression that it's moving. I rendered this as its own layer and set the ship as a holdout which gives you this. Then when I'm comping it in Nuke, I just put a slight glow on it and then put it over the top of the rest of the renders. I also added some heat haze in Nuke just to give it a bit more punch and make it feel more intense. This is done with a couple of noise textures in a very simple heat haze gizmo. Inside of this there's an eye distort that makes it all move based on the noise texture and then I'm also using that noise texture to blur the image slightly as well. The combination of the distortion and the blurring gives quite a cool heat haze look and then to make a mask for where the heat haze was going to appear I brought in the geometry of the ship from Blender and then made a custom piece of geometry in Nuke that just fits inside of the engine and then used the geometry of the ship's engine to cut it out as a holdout. This basically gives me an interactive 3D mask I can use to define where the heat haze appears in the shot. This is the alpha with the holdout and if I unplug the ship geometry this is what it looks like before. So this was just a cool trick to perfectly cut out the engine to make the mask. And that's pretty much it. This is a breakdown of all of the different layers and compositing stages. So there we go, if you're still interested in putting yourself in a spaceship, hopefully this video will have been quite educational. Hopefully you guys managed to keep up, I know there was a huge amount of information there in quite a short space of time. I often get criticised in the comments for speaking a bit too quickly, but if I took my time and talked at a normal pace then these videos would be 45 minutes long. Remember, you can get all of the assets from this video on Patreon just for $1, and if you'd like them, all of the animated Blender files and Nuke scripts will be available in the Project Files tier, which is just a few dollars. Thanks very much for watching, consider liking and subscribing if you got this far in the video, and I'll see you next time.